Cold is the absence of heat. Cowardice is the absence of heart. And fear is the absence of hope. Frostpunk is a world where you're a hair's breadth away from any of the before mentioned extremes. In the late 1800s, Earth was on set with a collection of unfortunate events, some of which are theorized to have contributed to what would be known as the Eternal Winter. The Eternal Winter is both described and experienced in Frostpunk as a permanent and gradual cooling of the Earth, with seemingly no end in sight. The tragedies that are alleged to attribute to the Eternal Winter included a chain of volcanoes exploding, launching volcanic ash and soot into the air. A subset of belief is that this was an intentional act committed as a type of of doomsday weapon against the world by an unknown power. Very little evidence exists to support this claim, however. Volcanic ash is the widely believed and public explanation for the cooling that's beset the world. Above this, private research has indicated that the sun is dimming. Finally, it's postulated that the Earth's magnetic field was made irregular by one or more asteroids striking the world. I theorize that all of these can be true if you just adjust the ordering a little bit. An asteroid or series of asteroids strike the Earth, so it's caused our tectonic plates to become slighted, which incurred a series of earthquakes and activated a number of volcanoes. The magnetic the magnetic field which normally protects the earth from an overabundance of heat from the sun now instead cut off a livable amount of heat as well. This magnetic disturbance mixed with the volcanic ash that coated large parts of the earth makes it seem as though the sun is dimming. Whatever the cause, the world and its people began their slow descent to societal collapse. Across the globe, governments of all kinds spread out to investigate the cause of the cooling as crops everywhere began to die and a chill and famine struck the world. In tandem, panic swept the masses and governments across the globe tried their best to placate their citizens and keep them under control all while preparing for what was looking like an eternal winter. It's important to note that technology in Frostpunk's late 19th century is drastically different from reality's 19th century technology, in no small part due to Mr. Hawkins, who developed a technology that's the catalyst for human survival in the face of the eternal winter. This invention is the steam core. Steam cores are a sort of compact, powerful engine powered by presumably heat and steam. The exact workings of the steam core are long lost along with Mr. Hawkins a mile underwater somewhere in the ocean, as he was traveling in a prototype aircraft known as the Dragonfly, a sort of modern day equivalent of a biplane. But what is evident of the steam cores are their ability to power some of the most useful pieces of technology and machinery in the world of Frostpunk. Some of the technology powered by steam cores include coal mines and wall drills, which used compact but powerful drills to break apart deposits of coal and wood respectively. Hothouses were another building powered by steam cores, a building capable of growing plant foods in the face of the upcoming powerful cold. Mega vehicles were also also powered by these steam cores, like dreadnoughts, which came in a land and a sea variant. Their restrictions in their names were true, but these machines otherwise were meant for the powerful cold destined to sweep the world. Dreadnoughts were giant machines capable of carrying either large amounts of cargo or many people, sometimes both. The last and perhaps most important of the steam core using machines were the automatons. Automatons were large mechanical creatures whose function were often diverse. Automatons are capable of treating sick and injured persons. They can also carry materials and perform maintenance in the face of the snow and cold. A specific subset of automatons were only recently put into use called the automaton lancers, which were an automaton outfitted with crowd control capabilities used to combat the rising tensions across the British Empire. Before continuing on, I would be remiss if I didn't also mention the lamps on every citizen's chests used as a light and a heat source first and foremost, but also as emergency beacon if need be. These lamps were built to last in perpetuity with maintenance, how it works, however, is unknown. One of the most important inventions of all time was about to be invented, however, the generators. Generators were a last ditch super project put into place by the major cities of the British Empire. Generators were giant cylindrical machines that when fed coal produced heat and energy to the nearby areas through a series of intricate pipes and valves. A machine that's exact workings are unexplained, but their effect is readily apparent to the player. It heats homes in the sub-zero temperatures that most people in the world of Frostpunk must live, but it also powers factories and resource repositories. As the world and its people started freezing and starving, the British Empire made their move to implement these generators across the Northern Island. I hear you asking, North? Why would they ever go North instead of towards the equator where it would be warmer? 
but before I answer that, let me first theorize the exact area these generators were constructed. A directional signpost in game reads, London, 1934 miles. So if we take a radius and place it on London here, we can see all the northern areas along the black line are the potential locales for where Frostpunk takes place and where the generators were built by extension. While it's possible that Great Britain had encroached on the territory of Greenland or western parts of Russia, I find the likelihood improbable without sparking an unneeded international conflict. This project was to be of utmost secrecy, so a war was about the furthest thing from subtle. I believe instead that the area to construct these generators was the small archipelago located to the northeast in a country known as Svalbard. We can sort of confirm this in-universe as well, as reindeer are hunted in-game before seas might freeze and natural immigration might happen. And we can cross-reference this with a map of where reindeer are located naturally, which immediately excludes Greenland. To address the question of why Great Britain would choose to build north instead of south, we have to presume the future. Locations around the equator are most suited to the warm, including wildlife and geography. Inversely though, northern areas' ecosystems and geographical features are already acclimated to the cold weather. This in tandem with the fact that the project was going to be kept of utmost secrecy, Great Britain fled north as the whole world was going to freeze, and freezing a little bit less wasn't worth not having the preparation time before societal collapse a decision that may have just barely saved thousands. Unfortunately, the haste with which the generators had to be constructed, and with the lack of resources and logistics available with the upcoming collapse of civilization, many of the generator projects were abysmal failures, or would be in time. From what I can gather, the division of labor was as follows. London coordinated the building of the generators, where each generator was to house the inhabitants of at least one major city. For example, Generator Site 113 was to house the people of Liverpool, and another nearby generator site was to house the residents of London, and so on and so forth. A few other nearby sites weren't as lucky. Site 107, in an effort to finish their generator on time, ignored the concerns of a young engineer, and the core of the generator caught fire and exploded, killing dozens and ending Site 107. Another nearby site, Site 120, were the victims of an inexperienced and cruel supervisory staff who abused the workers until those same workers revolted and destroyed the site with fire and rioting. The remnants of Site 120 split into two groups, one who stayed behind and nursed their wounds, and another group that fled off into the barren wastes. News about the last site made available to the player is Site 41, where you encounter a caravan carrying materials to finish construction of the generator that would become the city of Winterholm. Unfortunately for the caravan and the residents of Winterholm, those materials would go unfound. To finish construction of the generators, Great Britain pushed the envelope of ethics and used slave labor of convicts at generator sites with the promise that the criminals' crimes would be forgiven and they'd be given amnesty. They just had to work in inhumane conditions and definitely with little food and warmth. One of these prison transports got caught in the freezing of the oceans as the cold swept the earth and would overthrow their former slave drivers and escape becoming a later group in the world of Frostpunk called the Shipwreck Camp. Finally, a frost had consumed the world and the citizens of Great Britain were forced to react. In return for funding these expeditions, the wealthy and elite of Great Britain were given first consideration on advance notice of the impending doom, being assured their place in these new super cities in exchange for funding. Some artifacts and jewels of Britain were sold to the highest bidder again to fund these undertakings. A group of nobles set out to their generator, but were beset by the underclass who had caught wind of their plan after being promised shelter for having built the generator, and hijacked the ships destined for what would be known in the Frostpunk community as the Sanctuary, another generator site. The lords tried their best to stop the underclass from hijacking their ship, and even fired upon the fleeing underclass as they left home. The nobles continued to pursue the residents of Sanctuary, as the cold weathered their bodies and hunger overtook them though, finally they were forced to ask for help from the same people they'd left for dead weeks earlier. It's up to the player whether to turn the other cheek or to turn them away at the door. At the same time, future residents of Winterhome make their arrival at Solvbard and are immediately on set with bad luck, as their supply trailer they'd been hauling has to be released from the convoy after it nearly falls down a ravine after a collapsing an ice bridge. 
Then, one of the three dreadnoughts carrying civilians and supplies' as boiler explodes, killing everybody on board. Finally, the two remaining dreadnoughts arrive at Winterholm, where one dreadnought is immediately stripped for parts to construct the burgeoning new city. Winterholm at first was able to flourish and support a population of nearly 600, and staff resource outposts, a weather station, and an outpost built on charting and exploring the waste. Unfortunately, the camp began to fall apart under the stress of the new cold world, and the leader, a former army captain, imposed order using force. This led to many people abandoning Winterholm, and those that were left rebelled, and the city was largely damaged as a result. The generator that was sustaining Winterholm couldn't do so for much longer, however, as it started to fail, break down, and approach critical mass and nearly explode on several occasions. What was left of Winterholm refitted the last dreadnought that they had arrived on and evacuated, leaving Winterholm's generator to explode. Now all that is left of Winterholm are a few survivors who have fled to nearby locations and the exploded remains of their generator. One of Great Britain's pet projects in the face of this great calamity was to create several arcs full of seeds to repopulate the earth and were to be taken care of by a team of scientists and automatons. This project was so important to them that it warranted its own functional generator. As a fun side note, the real life seed vault is also located in Svalbard. Not really relevant, I just thought it was cool. Once the arcs had been secured, a stranger stumbles into the camp and begs the scientists for help. The stranger city of New Manchester is dying because of the lack of skilled workers and poor leadership and will perish in the upcoming winter storm if they go without help. Again, it's up to the player whether to help the city of New Manchester survive the coming storm or leave them to their own devices and focus on the seed arcs. Americans also make land in Svalbard, along with Nikola Tesla, where they construct a city that combats the snow with its great Tesla coil, zapping things that assail the city, intruders or otherwise. Tesla was a very cruel ruler though, and banished any injured or ill inhabitants to the cold and unforgiving wastes. Tesla viewed those around him as cogs in a machine and dispensable. He focused solely on the able-bodied, inefficient, and the rest were left to die. One of the most technologically advanced cities in the wastes finally meets its end as the static field that covered the city killed the inhabitants and left it a ghost town. Nikola Tesla was able to make his escape, but was hounded by a few people intent on making him pay for his transgressions. Finally, Tesla met his end to those same hunters. We arrive finally to the main events of Frostpunk the game, in which former residents of London, after weeks and months of staving off cold and hunger, decide to make their pilgrimage to a functional generator in the hopes of a better life. After establishing the basics for survival, the new city now called New London seeks nearby generators in an attempt to establish contact, but when arriving in Winterhome, they're greeted with only the ruins of an exploded generator in a now dead city. This stirs residents of New London to want to flee back home to their original London, but thankfully, with time and effort, they calm down and decide to make a home out of New London. Good times never last, though, in this world, and as quick as things have calmed down, things also seek to cool down as a great frost approaches and the temperature of the world is set to hit an all-time low. New London prepares for the oncoming storm and meets a few camps of academics researching local phenomenon, including asteroid collision sites and magnetic research stations. They they also hear tell of an Antarctic researcher named Nansen, who went from camp to camp and warned everybody who would listen of the oncoming storm. New London hunkers down and survives the incoming calamity as the world again begins to warm slightly and return to pre-Great Frost temperatures. The story doesn't end here though, as after the Great Frost, New London sent out several outposts to bring them supplies. One such outpost, Outpost 11, would send shipments of steel from a former military outpost until they had found a great cache of steam cores. New London at this point began to dissolve internally from several issues that plagued the city. At the top, though, was a new kind of bureaucracy that made any decisions that had to be made long and grueling. Instead of a decisive New London, any decisions were now argued about in great length until they were solved. As such, New London suffered from famine as crops died and there was a food shortage then their generator malfunctioned, and finally they were on set by an epidemic and many of their people got sick. This dissolvement made it so New London had to ask more and more from Outpost 11, until finally Outpost 11 announced their independence and broke away from New London. 
New London announced a reactionary measure in a few weeks, and in the meantime, Outpost 11 sought allies for the upcoming battle. This is where they met the shipwreck camp full of former criminals who had overthrown their captors. Outpost 11 also meets the Hot Springs settlement, who survived the storm thanks to the natural hot springs that kept them warm in the Great Frost, as well as allows them to raise crops in this barren landscape. Finally, Outpost 11 meets a mine full of children. The mine was formerly owned by Winterhome and later scouted by New London, but now the machinery doesn't work, and the children's navigate the mine and were able to survive the Great Frost hunkered down in those mines. After Outpost 11 helps the other civilizations in the Frostland, they're confronted by a group from New London, but instead of a confrontation of swords clashing, the group comes asking for food and shelter as New London is falling. After re-establishing communications with New London, you make the weighty decision to either save New London from their fate by some supplying them with resources needed to re-establish New London, or allow New London to fall and rally all the communities under Outpost 11's banner. Whatever your decision, life in Frostpunk is finally slated to calm down, and an age of peace and prosperity is here, for now. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, Frostpunk is amazing, uh, as are all things that 11-bit seems to create. I'm uh, looking forward to Frostpunk 2 in uh, 2024. The Steam page is in the description. I'll see you guys in the next video. Later!